Hi, my name is Howard Jones and welcome back to another of my online painting tutorials. I'm diving straight in on this one. I'm working from a photo that I took some years ago. It's the courtyard at the Royal Academy in London. I want to paint this as a tonal study. There are quite a few colours in the colour list which is going to pop up on the screen soon. There's an example of um, the painting. Um, despite the rather large selection of colours, I'm going to mix them into neutrals. So, just a quick look at the tonal scale that I've used. I've used the whole gambit here from one black through to sort of three, then jump up to six, seven, um, eight, and, in, and ten, which is white, of course. I'm working from my basic palette here, like like sandstone, really. But with with the shadow areas as they are, I don't want to make it too warm. It's not as though this is not the Mediterranean as such. So I'll just hit through here with a mix of raw sienna, light red, and. Um, a little bit of neutral tint. The area that I do want to keep light is the, is the foreground, is the courtyard, which seems to be um, extremely well illuminated. So here's the archway. There's the ground line at, this, at the furthest end of the courtyard. There will be a little bit of the local colour of this um, pillar on the right here to come into play. And then I've got the foreground itself. I'm really establishing the, just the, the main areas, the main shapes, the big shapes. It gets a bit stronger, a bit darker down here. But people are sat. I'll just let that dry off a little bit. So, and I'll warm it up ever so slightly with just the light red and burnt sienna. So it just goes a bit stronger in, in, in colour rather than, well, in colour and tonal value. So in this right hand side, suggesting that this is where we're, we're pitched, the view is pitched, just slightly over here to the right. I'll just let that dry off a bit. After a little bit of water for some, for some texture in there. So bear with me while I speed dry this with my hair dryer. Okay, so what I do next is I'm going to pick up my um, small point number six brush and I'm going to re-establish some of the uh, line work, the drawing that I put in and I'm picking up raw sienna, light red and a little bit of cobalt blue and this is a really really dry mix. Um, it's just short of what I would con what I sort of call dry brush, but um, it's to establish all the main architectural features, go around areas that I know will need uh, to be e uh, easily read for the viewer, you know, to make things clear so you're not playing games with the viewer. Just just spell it out as as it were probably did the wrong thing here and started working to the right. I'm right-handed, end up smudging the work that I've already done. There's a window in here. I'll just place him that one in roughly. I don't know 
that many um, watercolorists who sort of put this amount of detail in this early. But it, it, it sort of works for me. Uh, and what made me do this, the reason why I work this way is because um, in the early days when I was learning the how-tos, uh, I would find that I'd, I'd left a lot of the detail to the very end, so my windows would go in at the very end. And then by the end of the painting, I'd wonder why the whole painting looked like, you know, the, sorry, the, the, the windows looked like they'd been cut out and stuck on. Um, didn't like it at all. So, and the reason, I, I worked out the reason why eventually, and that was, you know, if, if, if everything is hard edge, which it would be if you uh, applying these shapes to um, the dry, dried finished painting, then it's gonna, it is gonna look like it's cut out and stuck on. But by working this way, um, with the, um, the washes that, that are gonna come after, in the next set, in the next um, stage, the washes will be able to subdue those lines and, and, and make the windows look like they're actually sitting in the wall rather than cut out and stuck on. So it softens, basically. It's, it softens the uh, lines, the edges, which prevents them from looking like they've been cut out and stuck on. So it always looks a bit weird. In fact, it looks quite awkward when you, when you work this way, but you have to be a bit patient. So, right, okay, although this is a, a dark uh, paint that I'm using, I do try to make sure that, you know, I hit areas with um, a change of, of, of color temperature in this paint. So I just made sure that these lines that going in now got a bit more blue in them. Sometimes they go warm, sometimes they go cool. So a line is more than just a line. It, it, it just make sure that there's a hit of warmth and there's a hit of cool in places. It is mostly neutral. Uh, right, okay, so let's move to the sides here into these windows. And I'm just being mindful that um, I'm keeping to the rules of perspective. So I think this line comes down about here. These windows want to, you want to give the impression that when this line comes down and meets the corner and the angle changes, that this top line here is th the same as this, um, this line coming in here. So it's getting a bit blue, that paint. So let's just pick up a bit more burnt, uh, sorry, light red. Just dot the odd change of color. Now, these windows on the left here, it's a good idea to sort of make the furthest turn of angle, the corner of this window here is slightly bolder than this one. So make this one bold and this one less uh, heavy. Because we'd see more of this um, turn of angle as it, as it goes into the window. That's the sort of window sill framework angled down slightly. So remember that these windows will have a bottom sill and that line there, again, let's couple up with the line that goes across here. And there's a vanishing point on the eye line. If I take, if I take a pencil and I've, I use the top of those windows, the vanishing point is going to hit the eye line somewhere over here. That means that this line has also got to converge in the same spot. And I always think of it like a, the hand of a clock as you go around the the painting like this. If you were directly above it, you'd have a vertical line. But as it, the closer you get to the uh, 90 degrees, the more acute that this angle is until you get down to flat um, on, on the eye line, of course. Let's say the eye line is there. Anything below, below the eye line is going to be an, a, a line that travels up towards the uh, vanishing point line. Okay, let's get back to work here. Now, 
there's my vehicle. So just want to establish its rough position and make sure every time I do a, a vertical line for these lower windows that it falls vertically in line with these. So I think we're okay there. That might be slightly too wide. So very nearly, uh, I, th I, th I think that's probably enough for the background at least. I'll, start, I'll pay my, start paying my attention to what's going on in the foreground here. But our foreground figures will definitely be a job that's required towards the end of the painting. So, but as long as I remind myself that there are figures here, because I've <laughs> done it so many times. Uh, oh God, too many times to, to try and remember um, that I've forgotten elements of my drawing. So. What I tend to do is this, is, is just outline the, uh, the salient bits. There's a chair here, so I can make good these when I get towards the end of the painting. So probably going to pause this in a moment. Um, Again, I haven't put the figures in as such yet. I might do some before I start the next wash, but I'd, I really want to establish my um, like the, the main elements here with the, with the drawing. Okay. Okay, we should be okay if I just. Just place a couple of, the indication of a couple of figures here and there. A couple of people together here. And if we don't like them later, well, there's usually a way of fixing um, it's usually a way of fixing the things that y y you've, you'd, you've decided not are working. So just be a little bit careful at this stage. That, that's enough for now. I know that there are figures around here somewhere. These might get lost eventually, but okay. Now before I put the next washes on, just, just put in some of these uh, perspective lines across the across the courtyard here because they converge roughly speaking around here um, I'm just gonna indicate the dark archway before I start getting back into um, putting further washes down so this is ultramarine blue light red a little bit of alizarin crimson pretty bold confident if you That's going to be one of the darkest areas in the painting here. Uh, to show our uh, couple of some of these shapes here. Okay. All right. Let's move to the next stage, which is further washes. Okay, so I've spent about two minutes here um, drying, just uh, hair drying my painting off so that I was sure that the, the darks um, were, were dry enough for me to continue. If you, um, if you do run over an area and find it still a bit uh, damp, it shouldn't do much damage at this stage. So my next, my next uh, step here is to re-establish the tonal values. So I've given myself enough detail just to keep me in line, um, so I don't stray away from the original storyline, as it were. And my thoughts are now as to how I really lift the area and give it this sort of atmosphere, give it the light that, um, that was there on the day. Um, 
it was very intense on the centre of the courtyard with these surrounding areas in varying degrees of diffused light. So there wasn't, although on the building itself there was no hard-edged shadows, um, if I were to copy that I think the painting would lose dynamics so you will see me um, exaggerate some of the uh, shapes on the shadows and that's what will bring some dynamics. I hope, he said all confidently, like a fool. Um, I've got plenty of paintings in the bin that uh, never saw the light of day as a result of getting these things wrong. So um, I'm mixing up a cooler, darker uh, mix here. It's, it wasn't really uh, a day of colour. It was, I think, if I remember rightly, it was late spring uh, that I took this a few years ago when I was there. Um, so, although I don't want to go completely monochrome uh, into the greys, that is, I suppose, it, uh, grey monochrome, um, I, I, I do want a little bit of warmth in some areas, so I'm mixing up light red, alizarin, sorry, not alizarin crimson, light red, ultramarine blue, uh, and further hits of uh, raw sienna. Not quite ready to do the actual shadows yet, I just want to establish some stronger shapes. So let's have something on the vehicle here. I immediately see that that is quite a, a weak mix of paint. Okay, and I'll travel through here. There's some figures here. And their shoulders are up here somewhere. And head height about here. Just again, cutting down on the water, increasing the paint. This is a, a sable brush. I'm cutting around a couple, there's, there's a couple of figures here, but I've got to be careful because they sort of, they encroach the figure that's sat down in the foreground. So a little bit, be a, a, a tad ca careful there. Here's my vehicle, this van. So I'll leave it like that for a moment and I think I'm just going to go back to my flat brush. And start establishing this area at the back of the courtyard again. So warmer down here. Try and stay off the tops of the heads of our, of our figures. Go across the ground again into the um, archway. There is the world the other side. There is a world the other side of the archway, which I will indicate with a few horizontal lines as though there's the buildings across the road. And now I'm going to once again darken over here, leaving a little slither of light over the top of the van, the vehicle. And just keep strengthening the values. Keep strengthening the values. I think I'll just cut into the edge of that vehicle there. It's looking a little bit cut out and stuck on. And into the corner back here. It's always good to indicate there is change of tone in these areas and now I'm going to once again dry this off. Just come in underneath this 
table a bit and our figures. And when I get to, once I've dried this session off, we'll be looking at how we uh, fine tune. So, just always just looking for the blocking in the main, the main points, the main uh, storyline. Okay. And I'm looking less and less at my um, photo now. So I'll just, we'll just take a pause there and dry this off. Okay, so um, I've dried off. I've managed to keep my, uh, most of my washes warm. Um, most, uh, that is to say there's a little bit of coolness over on the left, but most of this area that's close to us is made up of light red, raw sienna, um, a little bit of neutral tint to darken it. Now what I have to do is establish um, more detail before I finish. And so I'm going to be working on the main characters in the foreground sat here having their morning coffees. Um, and we'll see how it goes from there. Like most watercolour paintings, it'll probably try and catch me out. It, um, that's the nature of watercolour, I think. And the uh, worst thing you can do is, is fight against it. If it wants to go one way, go with it. That, that's, that's the way I've always sort of looked at it. Um, actually, that's not true. It's not the way I've always looked at it. It's something I learned years ago. Uh, I learned that if you try to fight watercolour, um, it, it, it generally will go foul on you. It, it, it's a great friend if you just work with it. Don't fight it. Don't worry about... Don't worry too much in the early stages as to whether things are going right or wrong. Some of the worst paintings that I've started end up being the best paintings by the end of it. So I'm mixing up um, light red ultramarine blue, neutral tint here, so I'm getting a real rich paint um, and keeping the water to an absolute minimum. Uh, so I've created here a sort of deep maroon sort of colour. Um, so let's look at these figures. I have also in my hand at the ready a small number six round brush and I can do a little bit of extra manipulating with this with this brush. So let's play safe and work over here for a moment. I'll suggest under here this character's legs. It's just a basic shape. So it's a bit flat in colour because, you know, I've sort of mixed it on the palette. So if I just bring in a little bit of, say, cobalt blue with the smaller brush and just break this, the shape of this character up. Now I'm not looking to put buttons on their shirts or, um, you know, um, tell my viewer whether this person is... Uh, what they're doing exactly they're just it's just the story just is about them just enjoying this uh, morning um, in London so that's all we need to know so dark here again I'll go slightly warmer in the face area we can I sometimes indicate a profile so there'd be a indication of a nose here there might be a bit of light over the top of the shoulder the hand as it reaches towards their coffee cup. Actually, that shoulder needs to come up a little bit more. And we'll put in an, a sort of inference of them having their legs tucked underneath uh, the table same here it's almost as though it's it's one shape and i'm using a lot of paint 
In fact, I need to put out a bit more. In terms of their, their um, tonal contrast in the, in the balance of things, they're not actually the main players in this. I still want this, our viewer, to be sort of taken here. So these characters here definitely go some ways to suggesting, um, you know, this is where the action is. So there's a back to this chair maybe, show a little bit of the seat. The other half of the chair I'll scrape out with my finger. And we'll put in a nice hit of uh, shadow underneath. And see if we can connect these up. I'm going to be careful here not to do too much. But as I did over here, I think I'll just bring in a little bit of a little bit of another colour here, just to spice things up a little. Can get a little bit flat looking if you just rely on. Uh, one dark flat mix. Same goes for the face. Uh, we'll just bring a little bit of warmth in here and on the cheeks of this person here. Now, if I just take a little bit of lamp black against this white courtyard, we can see that there, we can just indicate that there's something on the table in front of these these characters. Okay, and this is almost just pure um, neutral gray, uh, neutral tint that I'm using here. And I think this type of this jump in terms of uh, strength of paint and the amount of paint used puts a lot of people off. It scares a lot of people. But it's, it's so necessary for nailing the most important areas of your painting. Um, I'll just go into uh, my arch area again where there's some lovely uh, architectural uh, detail. So. Quick hit here, quick hit there. I will speed dry this again in a moment. Now, here's probably a good, I just want to lose that a little bit. It's a bit overly busy there. Um, here's, a, here's a good time to start thinking about how many figures you want to appear in this scene. So I'm just picking up a bit of cobalt blue along with a mix that I can't even describe to you. It's just about every colour I've used so far. It's in the middle of my palette here. Um, and I just want to say to the viewer, listen, you know, have a look at this lot up here. This is, this is where everything's going on. Just use the handle of the brush. I've made those a little bit short, so Let's make them a little taller, a little bit busier. I'll have them varying in colour a little bit there too, so a little bit of warmth. Just weighing everything up now. I feel as though this is a bit flat, this area, compared to what's here. Um, it might just be the fact that these areas are still wet and this is dry, but I'm just going to make sure that this is tied in. It's, being it it's tied in with what else is going on. Okay. I quite like these figures here. They look like they're having a nice time. Arm in arm. Day out in the big city. Just while well, the opportunity is there, some damp paint. I'll just. This could be 
there's often the indication of an ear on the side of the head. Um, just going to take a little bit of white to uh, the front of this character here, as though they're walking towards us in an open shirt. Okay. Now for that, I can always do a bit more of that as we move on. But here we are, these two guys, characters here. I'll put a little bit of warmth in the head areas. Perhaps warmth in the legs. There's she's just hitting the light a little bit. Facing the light, a little bit of slightly warmer colours in some of these head areas. And I think we're almost ready to uh, dry off again and put the, um, the finishing touches in. So um, just taking a rigger brush. This, this brush here, fantastic. I actually bought it years ago for um, my oil painting um, work. Uh, it's from Rosemary & Co. Uh, they don't pay me to advertise, but I I order a lot of brushes. I've used a lot of brushes made by uh, Rosemary & Co. Um, and I went for this long handle, as you can see, an e extra long handle. And I, I didn't use it for years, not for watercolour anyway, used it for, for the oil painting, but rediscovered it in my um, selection of brushes and I absolutely love it now it I hold it right at the back here which which conveys a lot of life in the brush if you you know that's the danger of holding smaller brushes or even big brushes like this you you choke down in the feral area which is useful for some bits but um, it can kill the life out of it but if you hold it right back here then all that really moves is is the finger fingers so just skimming through some lines to help convey this story. My pillar will have an edge to it. And some texture to it, because it's quite close to us here. Reaches the ground about there. Um, and I get so carried away with this sort of stuff. I've got to be really careful. It's so um, it's such an enjoyable part of the process. So let's see if we can get these ground lines back in. Mm -mm -mm. And then maybe we'll indicate a little bit of horizontal there. Now, one thing that concerns me is just how white this is. Now, it might work by the end of the painting, it might not, but now's not, probably not the time to do anything about it until I've done the shadows. So I'm going to very rapidly dry this off. Um, do the shadows, put make the shadow mix, uh, and then once the shadow is on there, we can decide whether this light area needs just a tad of warming up with something. So, right, let's mix up the shadow. Let's speed dry it first. Here we go. Now that should be okay. Bet you all thought you were at, sat at the hairdressers then for a moment. Okay, turning my attention down to my palette. 
So what I'm mixing in here now is ultramarine blue, uh, alizarin crimson, and a little bit of burnt sienna. This is going to give me my shadow mix. Uh, I'm going to start over here in the corner where I feel most confident. Uh, this is going to be the heaviest shadow. I've always got a piece of kitchen paper to hand in case something should go wrong and I would be straight into this lifting it back off. I'm really trying to create um, an atmospheric uh, light uh, effect. So taking lines in a sort of diagonal off what I imagine to be uh, car shadow from the right hand buildings. So it's quite a strong mix this reloading the brush as and when needed and just getting a f a, a individual shadows um, into the undersides of those ledges into the windows themselves and then I'll just pick up where I left off a moment ago so right over here I am going to have to put something I think over here on the left. Again, I'm imagining that the taller buildings on our right hand side are uh, offering an interesting uh, shadow shape on this left hand building. So it's a very arbitrary thing. It's something you've really got to sort of feel your way through. There are obvious places. Um, the, the, there was a, a sort of awning like a canopy over these tables. So naturally, um, I'm going to be putting these um, tables or this area under the tables, at least in shade. Now, this bottom area, I feel, is probably in need of some warming up and strengthening. Uh, the, you know, the shadow being closest to us, you'd expect it to be slightly heavier, slightly warmer. Now I'm just putting in um, some horizontal line. Um, it wasn't there in the photo, but I'm suggesting that there are vertical, there could be p posts, pillars, uh, lamp um, posts, but they break that otherwise stark white uh, uh, area in the fore foreground. Uh, sorry, in the in the courtyard. So I'm sort of sort of happy with it. I'm just enhancing area. I'm going into that corner. You generally find these areas where the angle turns um, slightly uh, more accentuated. So that just should tell the eye that there is a change of angle there. There is a corner in this courtyard. Okay. Yeah, I still think weighing it up that this nearer shadow area probably requires some further strength. So I've mixed a little bit more of the burnt sienna into that ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson, warming the shadow up again. It's almost as though you can't go too strong in this foreground. Okay, now I've got my number six round brush um, and that's white gouache. I tend to take it straight from the tube. Just take the top off and dip the point of the brush straight into the gouache, straight out of the tube. And I'm looking to sort of just add a bit of highlight on uh, shoulders. I'm just doing a bit of spatter in there. Um, it's a sort of it's a bit of a trademark if you like I suppose. I spatter most of my paintings at this stage. I just feel as though it offers uh, a bit of atmosphere. Um, as I was saying that it, it, it represents in the summer sort of seed pods, things you don't necessarily see with the eye but you feel, particularly if you're, uh, if you suffer from hay fever like myself. Um, but these things you feel are there. 
So the tops of shoulders just to offer a little bit of reflected light. There's the white shirt again. I thought I'd put a little bit more strength into that. Uh, it's a very intuitive thing, this. Maybe a, a bag there on that character catching a bit of light. A little bit of light just getting through to these foreground characters. Just gives them a little bit of outline, a little bit of extra definition. You know, sometimes these, these, uh, this information can get lost. Got to be careful you don't do too much of it. I'm terribly guilty of overdoing certain things at this stage. And I have to have this imaginary little sort of bird on your shoulder saying, stop, stop, you've done enough, put the brush down. Um, yeah, it, I still do it. And I don't know how many paintings I've produced over the last... 12, 15 years or so. Um, well, if I go back further, I've, if I kept every painting I ever did, I would probably need a, a juggernaut of a lorry to come and collect it, take it away to the rubbish. And I'm talking rubbish now. Anyway, here's my good old rigger brush again with white gouache. Uh, I'm just hitting areas that I think might be catching the light. I'm still using the white paint. A um, little highlight on the front of the vehicle over there. Something catching the light on the ground. It just breathes a bit of life into an area. So it's coming together. I am very nearly there. And I'm probably going to pick up a little bit of um, cadmium red or something like this now. Cad cadmium scarlet or Naples yellow or a combination of the both. Um, just add a little bit of warmth in places like uh, the faces. Uh, of the figures, an interior light maybe in the archway. So you can see that I've sort of dotted the I's, crossed the T's. Uh, the shadow's gone in and um, I'm just looking for uh, a brighter colour a bit of cad red that I can put just to lift a bit of cad red or a bit of Naples yellow both colors will do this will, will do the job let's have a look back to the trusted one in uh, sorry number six round brush and that's uh, cadmium scarlet and um, this is just a little bit of uh, it's actually a colour called Peachy Keen uh, by a company, an American watercolour manufacturer called American Journey. And they're great paints, absolutely wonderful paints. I'll show you again the photo that I'm working from. I've made it mine, at least I hope I have. Um, so is my intention. Watercolours are... Uh, a, a tricky medium um, and I'm sure you don't need to be told that but uh, but I stick by that sort of thing about if you if you try to fight it 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 it's gonna it's gonna win it's gonna beat you every time so when something goes wrong just embrace it go with it and never give up on a paint and never do that thing you know sort of oh look it's gone wrong again you're only five minutes into the painting it's gone wrong again another one for the bin N don't don't it can still go in the bin that doesn't matter but don't give up on the one you're working on now because effectively what you're doing is you're turning around at the very first hurdle whereas if you'd made the effort of getting over the hurdle by any means crawl over it jump over it knock it down out the way get through it um, the, the stuff that you learn after that is invaluable. That's taking you on to the next hurdle. Um, you'll never get to that next hurdle if you, if you ditch a piece of paper. Um, when I, I learned that years ago and 
God, it made a difference. It, it, it really made a difference. Because there's one thing for sure you can guarantee that watercolour will, every time you paint, no matter how long you've been painting, catch you out. It's trying to catch you out. It's trying to play, play a game with you. It's a bit like, um, I have a sort of analogy, you know, you've, it's a place you've gone to work, you've driven there for the last 20, 30 years. You could almost do it with your, in blindfold. Not that I suggest you do, because that would be very dangerous. But if you drive along this road, you know very familiar, and um, somebody has come out overnight and put a new roundabout. You just don't know where it is, you don't know where it's going to happen, but you can be sure somewhere there's going to be a new roundabout in that little route to work. Um, and that's where you, you, can, you have a decision. You can go around the roundabout and get to work, or you can turn back and say, well, I don't understand this, it's confusing, I'll, I have to give up, I can't, I'll never get there, I don't know my way anymore. Uh, that's what watercolour does, it, it just tries to catch you out. You don't know where it's going to be, you could paint the same painting ten times over over the course of two or three days, but each time you paint it, the little roundabout will um, basically uh, be somewhere different each time, but it will be there. So anyway, hope you've enjoyed this. Please subscribe and hope to see you at the next session.